This is The Ghoul's Guide to Santa Barbara. Cry on the inside like a winner. I know this one. It's Is it Pitch Perfect? No. No, wait. <laughs> it's Melissa McCarthy. Uh, no. No. <laughs> I mean, maybe she says that in another movie, but that's not the one. Oh, gosh. Not my reference. <laughs> you can cut all that. Uh, I feel like I know this one, but it's not coming to me. Is it? I don't know. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Is it? Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm snapping here. Is, what's the uh, dodgeball? Is it dodgeball? No. <laughs> no, but. Give us a hint. Cameron Diaz is in it. Okay, no, I don't know. No. You ready? <laughs> okay, tell us. Okay, it's the other woman. Oh, that's so that. have you guys seen that? Mm-mm. It's a good one. So Cameron Diaz, Leslie Mann, and Kate Upton. So like Leslie Mann's husband, she finds out that he's having an affair with Cameron Diaz, but then they become friends. Jetta hot girl car. Yes. 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 So many quotes from that movie live in my brain. <laughs> I've never seen it, but you told me that and that's yes. my media damage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think Leslie Mann, like this is where my brain went like to dodgeball and stuff. Cause uh-huh. I was thinking like Leslie Mann is also in a lot of those like Judd Apatow movies. Yeah. And so I was like going that's in that her husband, direction. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's like, so they become friends Cameron uh-huh. Diaz and, and Leslie Mann and okay. like there's one point point where she comes to the door and she's like just upset clearly because her husband's having <laughs> an affair uh-huh. and Cameron Diaz is like I can't talk to you until you stop crying and she, and she's like something like you know don't you ever get sad or something and she's like yeah but you know cry on the inside like a winner or whatever uh, yeah and like the Jenna scene another favorite where they're like stalking him <laughs> when they go find out that he's also having an affair with Kate Upton and they climb and look up over a fence at the house where he's at and Leslie Mann says oh hell no <laughs> and Cameron Diaz is like what She's got a Jetta. <laughs> Only hot girls drive, like hot young girls drive Jettas. <laughs> and Summers used to drive a Jetta. So. <laughs> She's a hot Aged girl. Out of it. <laughs> Yay. Good one. It's a fun one. I don't I think enjoy I it. ever dr- drove a hot girl car. Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> My friend Dan. <laughs> who Media we damage Dan. Before, yeah. yeah. A friend of the pod. <laughs> a friend of the pod. Hi, Dan. He refer- referred to the Volkswagen... Um, the rabbit, the convertible rabbit, yeah, uh-huh. as a bitch basket. <laughs> oh my god, that's, that's accurate. Terrible. That's accurate. <sighs> oh man. Yep. Well, uh, welcome to another guide of. <laughs> welcome to another episode of the Ghoul's Guide to Santa Barbara. I'm Jen. I'm Summers, and I'm Liz. On today's episode, Summers is going to tell us all about the bombardment of Elwood and the Refugio Prisoner of War camp. So I am a sucker for a British period piece. As we know. (laughs) Yeah. Especially about the Second World War. Even though the First World War is like my quote unquote favorite war to learn about. There's so many amazing World War II period pieces. I somehow end up reading books like the Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society or watching (laughs) shows like Home Fires or The Land Girls. When I lived in the UK for a while in York in the north, The war at home, meaning the sacrifices and hard work that ordinary non-soldiers did Mm -hmm. in World War II, is something they're super proud of, and they keep it visible even all these years later. There are areas of town where there used to be these iron railings, and they're chopped down to, like, these little nubs, and they'll never replace them because, like, they sent the iron to make weapons Uh and whatever. So they're super proud of it, and I just don't get that from Santa Barbara. (laughs) I don't know anything about Santa Barbara County during World War II, and I can't even imagine what it was like here, and I'm so curious. Yeah. So today I'm going to combine two Second World War events, the bombardment of Elwood and the establishment of the Refugio Prisoner of War Camp for agricultural labor that happened in the Goleta area and see if maybe they'll give us or me a better picture of what life was like here during the war years. Spoiler, it did help. Oh, oh it did. <laughs> yeah. I thought you were going to say it didn't. No, it did. <laughs> Wait, so you said refugio, like with the little... I'm going to bring that up okay. because there's a pronunciation thing. Yeah, and like, I'm curious about it. I researched why cool. people say it differently. Cool. So um, I'll, I'll bring that. Yeah, that was a good question. So first, we're going to talk about the bombardment of Elwood, yes. which you've probably heard about if you're from this area, because people from here like this story a lot, <laughs> even though it's got like next to no action in it. <laughs> the Second World War started like in the rest of the world in September 1939. 
when Hitler's Germany invaded Poland, but for us in the United States, our World War II didn't start until December 1941 when Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. I have opinions about us dragging our feet getting into that war. Mm -hmm. I think it was really crappy, but that's what we did. And I was not in charge. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that's probably good because when I'm in charge, things don't... <laughs> I'm not strategic. In the weeks after the Pearl Harbor attack, seven Japanese submarines patrolled the waters off the west coast of the U.S. and committed various acts of mayhem related to shipping. But they didn't actually attack any targets on U.S. shores until the evening of February 23rd, 1942. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, or FDR, was president of the United States at the time, and right at the moment we're talking about, 7 p.m. on February 23rd, he was on the radio live to the whole country. Oh. FDR yeah. used to do these things, um, called fireside chats. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, just little speeches on the radio, and he would speak directly to the American people, which was a new thing. Right. He did fireside chats pretty regularly, and they would be broadcast live on every single major radio station in the country. And for context for what that means, during World War II, 90% of American households had radios. Wow. And there are estimates that some of FDR's fireside chats could have reached around 70% of all Americans. So that's, I mean, yeah. that's some good market share, right? <laughs> yeah, like, for sure. He was doing great. <laughs> FDR's fireside chats started way before the war, and they were just a thing he did during his presidency, war or no war. And because of the chats, Americans knew more about politics than they ever had before, and they felt involved in the decisions made by their president's administration. The American people had, like, a level of trust in FDR that was, I think, unprecedented. Yeah. Because he was just, like, telling them stuff. And they could listen to him and kind of like feel like he's in their homes with them yeah. in a way that you couldn't do before. And I think we probably take for granted. Yeah. Hearing from him directly. Yeah. 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 I mean, we get to the point now where like having an unhinged president on Twitter just, you know, live right. tweeting his entire tantrums was a bit much. But before <laughs> this, I guess when you think about, you know, with the advances of communication during that time. Probably, you know, 10 years prior, there was no link to, you know, kind of a public link to the president. Right. It was probably just newspaper or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Right. So this Monday night in February is FDR's first fireside chat since the bombing of Pearl Harbor a couple of months earlier. And he uses the chat to tell the people of the United States that this war they're facing is going to be different than other wars. He calls it a new kind of war. And he says it will be different from all other wars of the past, not only in its methods and weapons, but also in geography. FDR says there will be warfare in terms of every continent, every island, every sea, every air lane in the world. And then he tells the American people to go get a map of the oh. world and look at it while he talks to them because he doesn't think they get it. And yeah. he really wants people to understand his strategy, at least the amount that he's going to tell them doesn't trust them to like be able to understand <laughs> what's going to happen if they're not looking at a map. So while the people of America are in their homes holding their world maps in their hands if they had them, mm -hmm. FDR tells them a few things. FDR says, The broad oceans, which have been heralded in the past as our protection from attack, have become endless battlefields on which we are constantly being challenged by our enemies. Which I don't know about you guys, but mm. I would take that to learn like, oh, hey, the Japanese military is like coming for you. Yeah. <laughs> like, especially if you're on the West Coast. Yes. I think. It's interesting because it almost like leans into like, is he excited about <laughs> like, <laughs> you guys, this is going to be it's amazing. Gonna be <laughs> <laughs> this war has <gasps> everything. Yeah, exactly. I exactly. Know. Yeah. Stefan. <laughs> it's like that. But almost, I mean, like, when you think about it, is there ever a point where a president's like, gosh, I hope a big thing happens while I'm in office so Probably that then I'll because be remembered you get the good, for it? And also, yeah. like, you know, look at George W. Bush uh -huh. during 9-11. Like, yeah. God, he was a bonehead, but, like, remember, everybody rallied around him. Mm -hmm. Like, Remember yeah. how, how Rudy Giuliani yes. was America's <laughs> mayor? <Yep>. I know. <laughs> Like, yeah, I had significant feelings of comfort from seeing yes. Giuliani at that yeah. time. And then later it was like, oh, what? What happened? Yeah. <laughs> so I think there's there's definitely like yeah. that goodwill from citizens, like when yeah. Yeah. the president is in the response. Yeah. Know, decent, and, somewhat decent way. <laughs> and FDR already is so trusted. That mm -hmm. 
We'll put a link to the fireside chats on our website, which you can find at ghoulsguidetosb.com. And that is, by the way, where you can go to see photos related to each episode. You can also find those on our Instagram at ghoulsguidetosb. And we always add a list of links to our research sources and put those in the show notes wherever we can as well. Back to the fireside chat. Basically, on this night, FDR is saying, don't expect to be safe at home this time. Oh, gosh. And an attack on American soil had not really happened in the sense of fighting a true battle in a war um, during the lifetimes of most of the people listening to the fireside chat. No, of any of them, because we found a book that said it hadn't happened since the War of 1812. Oh, yeah. So there aren't any, like, super, like, 200. Right. And, like, Hawaii <laughs> feels so far removed. Wait, yeah. This is after Pearl Harbor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, a couple months. Like, two and a half-ish yeah. months. Almost three months. So really scary news for radio listeners that evening. And the fireside chat ramps up and starts bracing the American people for war on U.S. soil. And right as that happens, an attack on American soil begins in Elwood, like that minute. Did Maybe you're going to tell us. Did, no, go ahead. Did he hear about it during the chat? Like, did he address it during the chat? No, I don't think he. Oh, okay. No, I don't. I don't think so. Okay. So here's what <laughs> happened. One Japanese submarine, an I-17 type submarine, I don't, I don't know much about submarines, but we'll show pictures, <laughs> uh, started shelling the coast near Gaviota, where a small crew of oil men were still working, even though it was like dinner time, around seven. Mm-hmm. Nobody was hurt at all during the entire bombardment, but the little crew of 30 oil refinery workers were so close to the shore and so close to the I-17 submarine offshore that they could see it really clearly. <gasps> And one of them, Gerald Brown, reported that the submarine was freaking huge. He didn't say freaking, though. He said it was huge. Oh, my god! He thought it was like a destroyer ship at first. It was so big. Oh, my gosh. And the whole top surface of it was up out of the water so that their deck guns could be used because that's what they were firing. Oh, my gosh. So (sighs) I-17 submarines are 365 and a half feet long. Thank you. That's... Enormous. (laughs) Which Enormous. <laughs> just a tiny bit longer than the long end of a football field. But Jen, I remembered you were not a huge fan of adopting the football field as our... Are you going to tell me how many Walmarts it is? <laughs> no, because that's a unit of area, not length. Oh, okay. But this is a weird one, but I think go with me. Imagine the Statue of Liberty, including the big pedestal that she's on. Uh-huh. That's 305 feet huh. from the ground to the torch. So turn her on her side and then attach the Hollywood sign <laughs> to the torch. Oh my God. And like, that's roughly how big it is. So it's oh big. Oh my gosh. Right. And Das Boot, the film, uh-huh. did not prepare me for the actual size of submarines. Yeah. And so I feel betrayed by wow. media. This I-17 submarine, captained by Commander Kozo Nishino, kept shooting from its desk deck gun desk gun (laughs) he's like in his office (laughs) kept shooting from its deck gun doing some really minor damage but generally freaking the people of elwood out yeah commander nishino sent somewhere between 12 and 25 explosive shells towards the shore he destroyed an oil derrick and i looked that up and those are those things that go up and down Mm -hmm, like the little bird in the water thing yeah uh and a pump house and did some minor damage to the elwood pier now, Elwood is slightly north of Santa Barbara proper yeah. and not super inhabited. So right. There's mostly ranches and stuff. Right. Um, so just kind of for context of people listening, no. when Thank you said you. freaking <laughs> out the people of Elwood, it's not like a... It's not a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> Precisely. Uh, yeah. When did it even become a city? <laughs> like, is it a city? No, it's not. I mean, I think no, it's Goleta. just part of Goleta. Goleta. Oh, yeah. yeah. Goleta didn't become a city until... I think it was when I was in England, so around like the 2000s. Yeah, uh, yeah. early 2000s, maybe. Mm -hmm. Wicked. Okay, so I found two fun in-the-moment responses to this event. Number one, my favorite one, was that of Mrs. George Heaney, who lived in a property along San Marcos Pass, Highway 154, so far away and up high. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Heaney was sitting in her house looking at the sea with binoculars. (laughs) For no reason. Not looking at her husband. Right? <laughs> he didn't no. work at the oil field. No. <laughs> she was, for no reason other than I hope that she was just like pretty sure that we were going to get attacked oh. and she was going to see it first. And I love that. She's like Mrs. Kravitz from Bewitched in my head. <laughs> and she was like, going to see it first. Mrs. George Heaney, I could not find her first name. Obviously, I, I felt like if I had maybe renewed my Ancestry.com subscription, <laughs> I could have maybe found some records, but I just wasn't willing to do that because yeah, it's very pricey. so common. 
to lose their name. I know. Ugh. But I feel like that one, since it was like pretty, re- it wasn't even 100 years ago. So I feel right. like we should be able to find her. But yeah. anyway, so yeah, she's up there keeping watch and she makes the first report of the action right at seven when it started. Wow. Or actually, it started a little after that. She saw the sub before. Oh. So she called in. And let, she let whoever, and she, it doesn't say who she called, but mm-hmm. we're going to get to that in a second. But she let whoever she called know that she could see the I-17 submarine. And she was also to attest that it was one mile offshore. Can you imagine? Oh, my gosh. Oh. Oh, so, okay. So in the movie 1941, uh-huh. Ned Beatty's character sees the sub coming off the shore, like from binoculars. Oh, okay, really? So, Maybe so that's... now I'm wondering if like this story kind of inspired yeah. part of that. Maybe. That, I haven't seen that movie. We'll have to. We'll put that in the recommendations in the yeah. show notes. That's, yeah, try to watch it. So I take Highway 154 on my long ass commute to work to Santa Maria lately, and I have really enjoyed trying to figure out where she was. <laughs> <laughs> and like, I can only—it's a really windy road, so you shouldn't really look yeah, off to the side. But the view's amazing. <laughs> yeah. So I've just been like looking real quick and being like, oh my god, like trying to like superimpose the image of yeah. the Statue of Liberty in the Hollywood side. Was it side. here? I know. I know. <laughs> like, was it here? And like, was she up there? Just so so curious but again that's probably something that i could figure out if i would renew ancestry (laughs) from census records i could probably figure out where she lived um so the second response that i liked a lot happened right next to that little historic gas station in elwood like elwood's pretty famous for it Mm -hmm. it was in the uh graduate the movie it's um hollister avenue yeah they just stopped for gas at it and i was like hey i know that i didn't realize that was that one Um, i always always think of the graduate whenever we go under the tunnel on the way up there too oh yeah yeah. Okay. That little gas station is called the Barnsdall Rio Grande Station, officially. I guess mm. that's like the oil company. Yeah, it has an interesting history, too. I kind of looked into that. At the moment, it's fenced off and doing the typical thing that we let our historic landmarks do. <laughs> huh. Slowly falling apart. Back in 1942, though, the Barnsdall Rio Grande gas station had a restaurant next door called Wheeler's Inn. And the owner, Lawrence Wheeler, heard a shell whiz by over his head that <gasps> night. So oh he called. Gosh. I know. So he called. Guess who he called? His mom. <laughs> his 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 nosy neighbor on the one fifty four. He called the sheriff's office. Okay, and oh, okay. for some Smart. reason, I guess that makes sense. But it's so funny to me, <laughs> like thinking that the sheriff of Santa Barbara County can do anything about, about a, a war invasion <laughs> with a submarine. Oh my gosh. I mean, maybe he called 911 and that was just who they connected him to. There first, wasn't 911 though. In the 40s. There wasn't 911. Not in no. the 80s. Mm, yeah. Wow. How yeah. did I? I believe like during the Golden State Killer yeah. murders, there was one case where someone hadn't been connected up to 911 yet because it was so new. So oh, yeah. I think it was like around that time. Yep. You call the operator, right? Oh, yeah. That's probably <laughs> what you did. That was probably your 911 was like asking a lady yeah. for help. Yeah. <laughs> it just delighted me. The thought that a sheriff's deputy could do anything about it, like an yeah, act right. of war. He's also, what, do you think some kid was launching? You know? <laughs> yeah. What do you I think mean, it was? Honestly, if, I'm, if I hear a bullet go whizzing by me, I'm not going to immediately think, oh, it must be a submarine. Well, it wasn't but, a bullet. It was like, but he knew what was happening. Oh, okay. I, okay. I don't, I'm not clear on how he could tell, but I think there probably had been some shelling and he was like, okay. This, yeah, that was yeah. like the first one. Yeah. <laughs> so I, it sounds like calling local law enforcement was actually a normal thing to do. It, so you said it was a Monday at like 7 p.m. Uh-huh. Like, was the restaurant open? Like, were the I don't, I were probably. At the gas station? Like, I don't know. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. But the sheriff's office, the an- the person who answered was like, warplanes are on their way. Oh, wow. But they weren't on their way and they <gasps> never arrived. There weren't any, which was fine because it turned out we didn't need any. Okay. Yeah, because I don't remember in any, in any of my like hearing of the story, I don't remember that there was any kind of like, like counterattack. Yeah, like a response. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There wasn't. That's so funny. Overall, the mostly harmless attack that was the bombardment of Elwood lasted only 20 minutes start to finish. Commander Nishino had done what he came to do, which was not to do any physical damage, <laughs> but to scare us. Yeah. So he headed west, and that was it. So west directly away from the coast. Mm-hmm. Not north or south, up or down the Santa Barbara County coast, but west. So there was no opportunity for any other witnesses aside from the Elwood people who had just seen the attack and Mrs. Heaney on the hill <laughs> with her binoculars. No opportunity for that. Yet, in Montecito, 17 miles south, a member of the clergy who was visiting from Pomona, Reverend Arthur Basham, called in and said he definitely saw the Japanese sub heading south straight for L.A. (laughs) Oh, gosh. Which was, you know, a a big city and a a center for organizing the war effort. Yeah. Yeah. Like a strategic target. 
So he called the police, too. So I guess Lawrence Wheeler of Wheeler's Inn would like did the normal thing. So that's what happened. I'm going to next I'm going to talk about the effects of the attack okay. that were not the physical damage. So over in a matter of minutes and Liz uh, sent me a, a source, a book that said the total damage was only like about five hundred dollars worth oh of damage. God. And I didn't look up how much that is today, but it's <laughs> but the event caused or contributed to at least three important things and three, the mass incarceration of Japanese Americans in internment camps. So we're going to talk real briefly about those. The first thing, UCSB in the Santa Barbara airport. So the U.S. Marine Corps, after the bombardment of Elwood, were like, oh, well, Santa Barbara is clearly a strategic <laughs> target that we need to be there. Uh -huh. So they called in the Army Corps of Engineers who filled in a portion of the Goleta Slough. A slough is a swamp or a shallow <laughs> system of lakes, usually a backwater to a larger body of water. And they built an airfield and a complex of barracks and military buildings to go with it. The Goleta Slough had an island in it at this time, Mescaliton Island, which had been the site of a Chumash village mm -hmm. called H-E-L-O. Hilo? Hello? <laughs> I hope it's not Hello. H-E-L-O? Yeah. Huh. Uh, and it was still like an important site to the Chumash people. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, they flattened that, as we do. Mm -hmm. The airstrip and the military operations buildings next to it are now SBA, the Santa Barbara Airport. And some of the Marine Station's buildings are, like, where the city of Santa Barbara staff who run the airport mm -hmm. work. Reportedly haunted. Yeah. Hi, Angie. <laughs> <laughs> but the bulk of the Marine Air Station's buildings, the barracks, so where the soldiers were, like, living and sleeping, got turned into the University of California, Santa Barbara, or UCSB campus when the university moved out of the city of Santa Barbara in 1954. Yeah. The second important thing the Elwood bombardment caused was even more immediate than that. Commander Nishino's crew of 12 men in the I-17 sub had done their job so well that they prompted an incident of war hysteria. <sighs> we now call the Battle of Los Angeles. I've never heard of this. At all. I like believe any reference. This is probably the inspiration for the movie 1941 oh, that I was talking about. So on Tuesday, February 24th, 1942, so the day after the Elwood bombardment, mm -hmm. the US Navy put out the message that there could be a Japanese attack on California late that night at 2 a.m., so the morning of February 25th. Okay. Military radar picked up something oh, that no. seemed like a credible sign of an attack coming from the ocean 120 miles west of Los Angeles. And air raid sirens went off in L.A. and military personnel got ready. They manned their anti-aircraft guns. Whoa. And they trailed searchlights across the sky. So you can like imagine it, <laughs> yeah. right? And about an hour later at 3 a.m., troops in Santa Monica either heard or thought they heard an unidentified flying object. Oh. I don't know how you hear that, but <laughs> I guess just motors or engines huh. going. And they started shooting with oh, everything no. they had. Like anti-aircraft guns, like the big ones on the ground. Just, and just like their machine guns they had on them. <laughs> just like into the air. Uh -huh. And they couldn't see what they no. were... So, uh, <laughs> can I just interject real quick? Uh -huh. So, um, at that base, annually, they do a, a recreation. Oh, yeah? And they do... Um, so, it's it's a like themed event. People dress up... Um, as if they like are 40s. from the 40s. Uh -huh. They have a live band. There's uh, a swing dance. Uh, and then they freak they out. Shoot no, no, no. <laughs> no, but they do. So each each year there's like a new, because there's all this speculation of what it actually was. Mm -hmm. um, so it's called the Great LA Air Raid. Um, oh my gosh, I've can we go? There. I've can been there. Go? It's oh, you super go again? fun. One year they had like, I think the year that I was there, they had like a, like a vintage plane did a flyover. What? Um, but so each time like there's, they do, they have some special thing cool. that is a reenactment of what might have caused oh my the, the air raid. <laughs> Amazing. So like, I don't know if anyone's ever like flown over in a fake UFO or like <laughs> maybe they had a, an alien show up or something. Oh my gosh. That wow. would be my favorite if they did that. I know. Cool. So it triggered mostly every other military defense unit in the greater Los Angeles oh area gosh. to join in until, according to the Los Angeles Times, like an article like right at the time, powerful searchlights from countless stations stabbed the sky with brilliant probing fingers, <laughs> while anti-aircraft batteries dotted the heavens with beautiful, if sinister, orange bursts of shrapnel. <sighs> so there was nothing. Yeah. Um, and since then... There have 
been like the army comes back and like analyzes this every so often. And I think the last time they did it, they were like, there was, I th- we think there was a weather balloon out oh my over the ocean and that was probably it. Uh-huh. There was a lot of damage to the area, <laughs> like buildings just got oh my God. worked <laughs> and uh, people died of heart attacks, but there, nobody got <gasps> no. like shot to death or anything. So. That's amazing that nobody like, I know that no bullets came down and killed anybody. Yeah. The U.S. Army's Western Defense Command put out a report pretty close to at the time. Although reports were conflicting and every effort is being made to ascertain the facts, it is clear that no bombs were dropped and no planes were shot down. Oh, my God. So, so you go. It's, uh, it's the Fort <laughs> MacArthur Museum. Oh, cool. Okay. Uh, down in L.A. is is where they host the event every year because that's the... Um, Thank you for looking that up. <laughs> my thought was just like, if you think you're being attacked, like... You're going to throw up those big old beacon lights? Like, isn't that, does this make you a target? Like, anyway. Yeah. I understand why they did it, but like they were already just blanketing the air with bullets so they didn't need to aim. Oh my gosh. The third thing that the bombardment of Elwood contributed to was the incarceration of Japanese Americans. I don't feel like I can do justice to that. Yeah. In a really quick thing. So like a quick segment of an episode and Although people from Santa Barbara County were arrested and yeah, mm-hmm. basically kidnapped from their homes and taken to mm-hmm. the L.A. area, we didn't have an internment or incarceration camp in Santa Barbara oh, County. Okay. I didn't want to leave you without a recommendation if you want to learn more about that. So there's a podcast called Campu, C-A-M-P-U, that does a deep dive and takes you through what it was like to be a young person forced to evacuate to a prison camp. It's produced by Densho, the... Japanese American Legacy Project, which is a Seattle area nonprofit working to preserve and share the history of Japanese American incarceration during World War II. Like that's their whole thing awesome. that they do. Um, and so we'll put links to Campu and the Dent Show yeah. project on our website and in the show notes. Yeah, that's such a unfortunate <sighs> yeah. example yeah. of that war in our own. The um the Santa Barbara Genealogical Society uh-huh. did a big Asian American history uh, oh. display. I don't think it's still up anymore, but but I think it you can view it online. Okay, let's look and, to that. And like one interesting thing that came out of one of their presentations was that so like families, so people that were incarcerated, if you were college age, you could leave to go to college. Oh, I had no idea. Uh, I know, that. isn't that just just like a random thing that huh. I that I remembered? But anyway, we're gonna skip ahead to talk about the 14 months in 1944 and 1945 when Refugio had a prisoner of war camp. But let me address a controversy related to the pronunciation of Refugio. Yes, please. I and many other Santa Barbara people, but not all, say Refugio, but it's spelled Refugio. And Jen says Refugio. I was wondering which one you say. I I say a couple different because there's words that are not Spanish that like I, yeah, I have have issues with all the different pronunciations. So there are posts on the subreddit R Santa Barbara about this. If you want to get into it, uh-huh. and we could link to one of them. <laughs> one had a comment saying "refugio" is an old Chumash pronunciation, okay. which uh, I don't know, but maybe it was. And another comment saying that "refugio" is like an archaic Spanish language pronunciation, but but, it's, but the G is not pronounced as an F in Spanish. Archaic, so okay. old, yeah. Like it's so uh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. So I've also heard "refugio" like with the yeah. And I only say it the way I say it because my instructor at the Steve Morris Defensive Driving School (laughs) is the first person I heard ever say it when we were doing freeway driving. Uh He'd have me drive up there and then turn around and go back. Just so he could say it to you? Down to Rincon, I think. No, no. No, it's just like I just I latch on to like the Uh first thing I hear, I think. I heard uh, John Palmateri say it, Refufio, one time and I was just like, what? Yeah, I think that was I the first grew time I heard up it. calling it refugio, but then like it started bothering yeah. me because it doesn't make sense. Why would you pronounce the <laughs> F as an F and then the G as an F? It's just tradition. Like we have so many strange pronunciations. Like the one that I can think of is like Gutierrez Street. It should be mm-hmm. Gutierrez. But how, how how did you say it? Gutierrez. Say it again. Gutierrez. Okay, I can't even say that. Okay. It's just like instead of like ear, you say ear. I don't. It's just it doesn't huh. make sense. But it, there are like little things like that. I mean, that's like people say crayons instead of crayons. Or I mean, we there's so many Hi, weird Tristan. things in the world that people say. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's it's it's, I know. it's always interesting though. But there's some stuff like some cultural Santa Barbara pronunciations yeah. that are interesting in that way. I'm I'm interested in the in the 
reference to it being a the Chumash pronunciation because what is the sorry this might be total <laughs> tangent but like what's the origin of the name right is it somebody's name is it like because if it's either. if it's a you know <laughs> if it's a, a Chumash, Chumash word, word for a Chumash that Chumash area then yeah like tell me the Chumash pronunciation I'd love to learn it and I will start <laughs> using that yeah I don't know <laughs> don't know We've mentioned Vandenberg Air Force Base before on this podcast <laughs> in context of being annoyed. <laughs> they got renamed Vandenberg Space Force Base. By the Race- Trump administration. Yes. <laughs> Vandenberg, which is near Lompoc, had another name back at the very start of the U.S. involvement in World War II. It was called Camp Cook. Okay. And at that time, it was used at the beginning of the war for teaching soldiers how to drive tanks. <laughs> oh, But by 1944, a couple years into the war, Camp Cook was being used as a prisoner of war or POW camp. That's wild. I had no idea. One of the things POW camps did, besides keeping us as a nation on the right side of the Geneva Convention by safely housing captured foreign combatants instead of murdering, torturing, Mm. or enslaving them, was they helped keep our nation and our armed forces fed. So I read my little scripts to my boyfriend, Steve, (laughs) before I'd read them to you sometimes. And so when I read this to Steve, he said it sounded like I was saying that we ate the POWs. (laughs) So I should have rewritten that, but I just didn't do it. So if you thought that too, let me clarify. I didn't think that at all. (laughs) Um, I don't mean it had anything to do with cannibalism. What I mean is POW labor would be loaned out to farmers. And the agricultural work POWs did in the United States during the war was actually sort of vital to our survival because we were in a really precarious position with our national food supply. Mm -hmm. If you were an American agricultural worker at the start of the war, you could defer the draft because it was clear farm workers were going to be really necessary. Yeah. Um, But it looks like not a lot of them did. I think just and we're going to get into this farm work is terrible. Uh So I think they were like, I'll take my chances. And plus there was, you know, you just wanted to be seen as, how do you say it? Like a stand up guy. Yeah. Right. Patriotism. Even though like, yeah, Yeah. everybody needs to eat. So that's also serving your country. (laughs) Yeah. So even with that draft defer option during the first year of the war, the farms of the United States had lost 1 million workers. I could not find a statistic for you on like, the context of that like how many were there in total that would have been Mm -hmm. helpful to know but today in the united states we have 2.9 million total farm workers yeah so like maybe we had more than i don't know i don't know it was a lot it's a lot a big proportion but i just don't have the percentage of how many we lost wow Mm -hmm. Because of this loss of workers, America's farms were already suffering very early on in the war. In Oregon in 1942, the governor of Oregon called on citizens to combine patriotism and profit by spending their Fourth of July holidays aiding the state's hard-pressed farmers. Wow. (laughs) The federal government was unfortunately not very much help to farmers until 1943 when they launched an agency called the U.S. Crop Corps. The Crop Corps served as an umbrella for labor services such as the Women's Land Army and the Victory Farm volunteers. There were just like a lot of like volunteer programs to try to be like, just go do it. Go do some farm work. But unfortunately, (laughs) but like just go spend your free time on a farm doing backbreaking labor. But but unfortunately, volunteer workforces weren't enough to help keep farms from going under or to keep even just the crops from rotting in the fields with no workers to harvest them. That was a threat to both the economy and to American food security at home and in the various theaters of action abroad where we'd sent soldiers to fight. In 1943, FDR declared January 12th to be Farm Mobilization Day, and he gave a speech saying that food is the lifeline of the forces that fight for freedom. The U.S. Office of War Information, which was our department for internal war-related propaganda, Uh (laughs) got pretty heavily involved in the food situation. So you might recognize the Office of War Information's work from such posters as Rosie the Riveter's Uh We Can Do It poster. (laughs) Or there's one that has, my husband wants me to do my part. It's got a a woman dressed like Rosie the Riveter Mm -hmm. and her soldier husband behind her looking really proud. Uh. (laughs) It reminds me of classic movie Grease 2, better than the original, Uh, the scene where they... (laughs) sing the song let's do it for our country oh. <laughs> when he tried to try to convince the girl gosh uh, i love that movie it's uncle sam who's asking so your mother will approve 
right? So the poster with the, I'm proud my husband wants me to do my part, was encouraging American women to seek work outside the home. Hmm. But the poster also simultaneously shames the husbands who weren't allowing their their wives to have jobs. So it's freaking genius. And I, during researching this, I kind of fell in love with the U.S. (laughs) War Office of Information. It's so like that poster is so like like his hand on her shoulder. And, uh, it's so like, yeah, paternal. controlling. Yeah, the U.S. Office of War Information worked on farm related messaging a ton and put out all kinds of outreach materials from pamphlets to movies, urging Americans to be really careful with food mm-hmm. and to see farm work as a worthy job to be doing because they kind of didn't see it. That <laughs> Sounds familiar. <laughs> I was gonna say we should do some of that now. Yeah, they had taglines like "Food fights for freedom," "Food is a weapon, don't waste it," and "Raising food is a real job." <laughs> and so here's the food is a weapon don't waste it poster i'll show you guys and we'll put it on our instagram that's why our parents were like clean your plate exactly oh yep exactly but i think it's just such a beautiful poster and like so well crafted yeah it's beautiful we'll post it on our instagram at ghouls guide to sb but the full ad copy is food is a weapon don't waste it buy wisely cook carefully eat it all in all caps <laughs> oh my God. and then follow the national wartime nutrition program as a footer but not the focus it's the don't waste it eat it all that you see as your eyes are like kind of drawn down through the composition towards the right and like the use of color is amazing for that it's just a beautiful piece i want it like in my kitchen <laughs> i wonder um, if you can find a print <laughs> i'm probably good yeah uh I am a graphic design dweeb, but so are you too. <laughs> and maybe some of our listeners are too. So I thought you'd appreciate it and want to see them. And American and British domestic propaganda from the Second World War is some of the most effective outreach messaging for behavior change that I have ever seen. And I really appreciate it. And they just went for it, like uh-huh. right for your throat with like your motivations as a human and your sense of shame and what other people would think of you and <laughs> fear of what would happen if your country didn't win the war. I mean, it's just genius. Okay, some of the posters harness the power of xenophobic wartime paranoia, which is not great. (laughs) But like, it was smart. It was so smart. Like, there's this one poster, the Grow Your Own Be Sure poster, which is less attractive, but Uh it's still a great one. But like, what a way to use xenophobia (laughs) and like, you can't trust anyone else. Grow your own food. Oh, gosh. Grow it in your yard. (laughs) Yeah. Everyone else is trying to poison it. Oh. Like, you know. Well, yeah, fear is like the biggest motivator. Yeah. I was so. going to say, it's like the more things change, the more they stay the same. Yeah. <laughs> but it's just, it's so smart. It's yeah. like using a terrible, like a terrible quality of the American people at the time mm-hmm. for something that needed to happen, which yeah. was like victory gardens in your yard. They were just, I get shivers. Like, I actually have <laughs> chills right now. Like, they were masters of their craft in this office. And I'm just, I'm impressed. But I admit that the eat it all tagline. <laughs> Is probably part of why a lot of us who are the children and grandchildren of the World War II generation have problems with obesity (laughs) and guilt about not cleaning our plates. So a little from column A, a little from column B (laughs) on the impact of our domestic propaganda machine. You know, the national benefits of the food posters, I was thinking of them as like, here for a good time, not for a long time. Like their effects were really important (laughs) right then, but they don't really help us today. Yeah, they lingered (laughs) too long. (laughs) Right. Okay, back to our story. The federal government thought up a few plans that worked a little better than volunteer workforces, but most of those plans were problematic in their own way. Um, One of them was like, child labor is fine. (laughs) (laughs) Which again seems to be making a comeback. Yeah. (laughs) I'm going to skip over most of them, but one of the plans the U.S. government came up with was basically, let's make Nazis do all the farming. Uh Not just Nazis, of course. And the non-officer classes of the economically disadvantaged enlisted men in the German military were arguably not Nazis in terms of their ideology or their ability to make any sort of choice not Mm -hmm. to fight for Hitler. Opinion and research has gone back and forth on the subject of did the average German person or the average German enlisted man know? Like in the 90s, there was a book called Hitler's Willing Executioners that was really popular that was basically like, oh yeah, all the Germans wanted the Jews dead. Like they were into it. And that was kind of accepted for a while, but it's not now. Uh So the London School of Economics, a team there, found that regular German soldiers were fighting willingly, but they saw World War II as like a patriotic continuation of World War I, Hmm. which was basically just they were trying to defend their country against foreign aggressors. There's also some research that like, yes, most Germans were Mm anti-Semitic, but they weren't like 
like let's wanting kill genocide. them all. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and then there have been some prominent Jewish scholars who are like, if they wanted to kill us, we wouldn't have stayed there. We're not that dumb. <laughs> right. Like, that's my summary of what they said. <laughs> um, and we'll have some sources on that. So, like, the POWs in the camp were, like, from the Nazi army, and some of them were probably true believers, and some of them maybe knew. We don't know. Tell, There's some doubt. Tell me again, like, where exactly this was, or, like, what's there now? This. Okay, so hang on, let me... Um, Did you already tell me that? No, right. but I'll get okay. I'll get through it in just okay, like a second. Nope. But it was um, on Edwards Ranch. So over the I course... I map, sorry. No, it's okay. We'll put it on the map. <laughs> okay. Over the course of the war, over the course of the war, 230,000 prisoners of war labored on American farms wow. across the country. The way it worked was large bases like Camp Cook that didn't have any sensitive intelligence functions and they weren't doing anything important. Like they were just teaching people to drive a tank. Like, right, well, that's right. Tanks. Right. <laughs> Um, so those were like the top choices for where to put POWs. But because transporting prisoners to and from farms to do their work took time and limited the number of farms that could use POW labor, if you only had like one really big camp in mm -hmm. one location, there would be a network of smaller camps around it. And that is how Refugio, a coastal area about 15 miles north of Goleta, got its very own prisoner of war camp in 1944 as one of Camp Cook's 16 reasonably local satellite POW camps for farm labor. Huh. Again, Steve asked, how did they get here? So if you're wondering how the POWs got here. I am. The, <laughs> the U.S. <laughs> agreed to take on the housing and care of large numbers of POWs because the other allied nations had already kind of captured so many. Whoa. So mostly European nations, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, and they were running out of room. <laughs> so <laughs> leaving aside POWs from Japan and other nations at war with the allies, the U.S. took in 450,000 German prisoners of war. Yeah. And there were 700 camps all in around the, the U.S. Yeah. 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 That, they didn't all work on farms. But yeah. yeah. But like, I I don't know. Like, I think of like POW camps. I guess I just always was like, oh, they were like on our bases in other countries right? or whatever. Yeah. I know. This was all <laughs> new to me. And for our listeners, I wanted to do like a World War II episode. And Jen told me about this camp and I'd never heard of it. So Yeah. yeah I, I found out about it and then I sort of put it out there for anyone else because I just it I read one article and it really talked about like more got into how they established relationships with the the owners of the local farms mm -hmm. and how like some of those people are like oh this is an amazing place the weather's so great and then like yeah. eventually Prisoners? upon their release yeah. like stayed oh. and you know yeah. I mean I support the Geneva Convention <laughs> And I get that, like, yeah, not everyone, you know, serving in the German military during World War II, like, really fully supported Hitler. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, there's something to be said for upholding his overall plan, <laughs> even, you know, partially. And I just, I have such... I mean, what else were they feeling? supposed to I do? Know, right? I know, It's hard. I just had... I Conflict. You're conflicted. I was... <laughs> yeah. yeah. I didn't feel like I could really present it very impartially and that's why i've kind of yeah. tried to hold back a bit on my and okay to go back to the london school of economics research it was really interesting because what they did was they realized that there was no source that was really accurate with finding out what the average german enlisted person in the military knew yeah. because everything was censored and read and everything so they used secret audio recordings of POWs talking to each other in oh. camps mm -hmm. because there was a reasonable belief that they didn't know they were being recorded. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the thing. Like they, they saw fighting in the war as like a patriotic duty, but nothing to do with death camps. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like at all. But they weren't great guys. Like a lot of them <laughs> were talking about like they enjoyed killing and raping. Yeah. Wow. They were... They were into it, even if they were conditioned to do so. Like, yeah. Well, and then, of course, so. after the fact, when they've lost the war, like, they're going to be like, oh, you know, if they, if they just interviewed them, of course, mm -hmm. they're going to be like, oh, no, I never supported that. I was exactly. just... Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Academic opinion on how much the German, average German person or member of the military knew, like, just go, like, goes back and forth and mm -hmm. back and forth. Um, yeah. And I should also state... Not all of the prisoners of war enjoyed murder <laughs> and raping, but some of them did. Yeah. Yeah. And again, and again, it's like, it's hard. I, I personally hear from this comfortable chair can't determine <laughs> what any one of those people was thinking. I can only, you know, come from the perspective of what actually happened 
to a lot of people and how terrible it was. And so, yeah. So the Refugio POW camp was built on Edwards Ranch near Naples, which is not far from where the Elwood bombardment took place. Mm -hmm. Edwards Ranch already kind of had a camp, but it was just for their regular farm workers before the war. Oh, okay. So it was pretty easy and cost effective to just revamp it. And the location was convenient for other nearby agricultural land. The camp was 91 acres or just over 24 standard Walmarts. <laughs> there a it little, is. <laughs> a little less than one-fifth of a standard Disneyland. Wow. <laughs> it had barracks for sleeping, a recreation center, a mess hall. You can see floor plans and photos from the camp on the Goleta History website. We'll put a link in the show notes. Cool. Prisoners at the camp were mostly Germans captured in the North Africa campaign that ended in 1943. And that is important for two reasons. The prisoners had been captured by other countries, not the U.S. France was mentioned, but I didn't want to go way into it, but it was (laughs) France. (laughs) And their conditions at first were super inhumane. They were like confined to the cars of cargo trains as their living quarters. And they were like used for slave labor and not fed enough. And they had lice and they were just like nothing clean. They just had to fester in their own filth. The other reason that North Africa is important is that some scholars say that those soldiers wouldn't really have known about the death camps because they weren't seeing it. But the Goleta History website says that some of the Refugio prisoners of war were high enough up in the German military to like know what was going on, be Mm -hmm. okay with it. Gosh. That same article, and Jen, you kind of mentioned this, where like saying that the German POWs were relieved to be in America because at least they could probably count on staying alive and not being tortured. The Goleta History article is very, like, yay Germans about the POW camp situation. Really? Out of all of the articles that I found, like, nationwide. But I didn't find all of them. That's just, like, in my (laughs) my quick research. Uh And it makes a big deal of how grateful the prisoners of war were, like, be able to get to work for us. And then also what you mentioned, the farmers were like, yay. Yeah, they, like, like took the some of them from Italy uh, yeah, I was just going to say Italian- that. Okay, go no, ahead. No, no, it's okay. Um, there were some <laughs> Italian POWs and they would take them to mom's Italian restaurant in downtown Santa Barbara on Coda Street. It's not there anymore, but there's a building uh-huh. that has, has like been. the mom's yeah. sign like um, kind of memorialized into it. It's not a restaurant anymore, though, but yeah. it's near Arnaldi's. If yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. It's, it's just that's like interesting to me on two fronts because it's like, let's not let's feed them enough. And, you know, like, yes uphold the geneva convention right but do we really have to like be taking people to their like favorite restaurants i I mean that seems a bit much but then also like how cocky is it of us to be like oh you're italian let's take you down to we have this super authentic like like imagine it's being like no it's no you guys are italian we're gonna drive you down to the olive garden i mean not to say that mom's was the the olive garden but you know it's just like maybe like just the red sauce joint i know i imagine these guys being like thanks what americans breaking the pasta into little pieces yeah was the whole vibe of the article gave me a little bit of pause but it was really really interesting and I'm sure that local farmers were relieved to have yeah. this captive workforce to work. And I'm going to tell you why. The Refugio POWs worked all day. They were bused back and forth so they could sleep at the Refugio camp. They were paid for their work. The Geneva Convention requires that everyone being forced to work during wartime be paid something. Hmm. The farmers, owners of the farms and renters who were working themselves to death and watching their farms fail when they couldn't process the land or plant enough of it or harvest all of what they had managed to plant, were happy to see the POW labor system put into effect. Even though the Office of War Information had been going hard on mobilizing Americans to help voluntarily, it wasn't working. And part of that was because the Americans available to do the work couldn't physically do it. There's this one poster, I don't have a picture of it, but it shows like this older retirement age couple in overalls, like (laughs) lined faces and like, you know, and it's like, go spend your whole summer working on a farm. And it's like, okay. Ma and Pa. Yeah. Have a heart attack and die, Pa. (laughs) You know, (laughs) agricultural labor is so hard. And I'm going to tell you how hard. Working on a farm is such difficult, exhausting, and painful physical labor that the U.S. government knows full well our domestic ag system would collapse if we tried to get Americans to do the work. Mm -hmm. And they know that because not only did they try that during World War II, but also because they tried it again in 1965 with a program that paid thousands of young, strong high school and college athletes to work on the farm for a summer. Wow. 1965 was the year after the Bracero program, which was another World War II program ended 
That's also known as the Mexican Farm Labor Program. It was another federal government ag labor plan that allowed Mexican citizens to come in and do the work legally. Mm -hmm. But Cesar Chavez later fought to end it because like the workers were not being treated fairly and it was really only great for the farmers yeah mm-hmm. but there was a lot of wage theft going on oh, and so sure. it was just bad but in 1965 the u.s is again facing a concerning so- shortage of farm workers and farmers are saying like bringing in the workers from mexico were the, that was the only thing saving us mm-hmm. and american citizens won't do it like yeah. our crops are going to die in the field figure something out and the government couldn't bring back the Bracero program because it had just been ended because of it was not a good program. They couldn't like just do a new one. It was unfair and abusive. So the government decided teenage boys should do the work. (laughs) The Department of Labor went all in on this program. NPR did a feature on it that we'll link to. (laughs) According to NPR, Secretary of Labor W. Willard Wirt, quote, cited this labor shortage and a lack of summer jobs for high schoolers as reason enough for the program. But he didn't want just any band geek or nerd. He wanted jocks. How dare you? I know. (laughs) Um, And he called it the A-team, Athletes in Temporary Employment (gasps) as Agricultural Manpower. I was a band nerd. (laughs) (laughs) Offended. You were not wanted. But I also don't want to go work in a field. (laughs) And you were also not born. But, um, (laughs) But the media wasn't buying it at all. The Detroit Free Press had an editorial that read, Dealing with crops, which grow close to the ground requires a good deal stronger motive than money or the prospects of a good workout. Like, for instance, gnawing hunger. So just acknowledging that this work is too hard and people won't do it unless they're basically forced to. That NPR segment is totally worth a listen. There's one of the kids involved works in Hollywood now. And he says his major regret is that he never wrote a screenplay about his time because it was just bonkers. And he said, he remembers the first day vividly. Work started before dawn. The better to avoid the unforgiving desert sun to come. The wind is in your hair and you don't think it's bad, he says. Then you go out in the field and the first ray of sun comes over the horizon. The first ray. Everyone looked at each other and said, what did we do? Oh, no. The thermometer went up like in a Bugs Bunny cartoon. By 9 a.m. it was 110 degrees. (gasps) And so problems just immediately that summer in Salinas Valley, 200 teenagers that had been brought in from around the country were like, oh, no, 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 (laughs) and quit after two weeks. There were strikes. And I read you that (laughs) and bring this up because as the NPR piece goes on to point out, that experience for the A-team jocks and the experience for the Bracero program workers and for all the volunteers like the Women's Land Army who were Mm -hmm. working on the farms – and for the German prisoners of war in the Refugio camp, it was all the same. The work was too difficult to do voluntarily. But the A-team kids had the ability to speak up about it. They mm-hmm. had the words and the audience that was on their side. And the Bracero laborers and the POWs didn't have that. So I'm wondering if maybe that's like one reason that a lot of accounts talk about like how grateful the POWs were. <laughs> because it was like, it was inhumane, in uh-huh. my opinion, but... I don't know. Like, okay, maybe they were clean and they didn't have lice anymore and nobody was trying to shoot at them. But like all the other agricultural labor camps for World War II POWs in the United States, the Refugio Satellite Camp was inhumane just by the nature of the work the POWs had to do. And it forced people to do backbreaking hard labor of the kind that wouldn't be allowed today, even in prisons. So I get why the U.S. came up with it as one of the answers to the looming famine. Mm-hmm. But to try to look back at it like a little truthfully and acknowledge <laughs> there was, it was problematic. And I'm yeah. sure that my opinion of it is also problematic. But uh, <laughs> so if you want to, you can go look at the little tiny piece of the Refugio camp that still exists oh. because it's disintegrating like so many of our historic <laughs> things. If you drive north on US 101, you can catch a glimpse of the only physical structure left, which is just a little wooden frame of the camp's water tower. Wow. And that is the end of this little glimpse into what life in the Santa Barbara area was like during World War II, which, as I told you earlier, is what I was looking for. Mm -hmm. I think I made some progress for myself towards that (laughs) goal, and I hope I did for you, too, if you were interested at all in what it was like in World War II. I didn't exactly find the sort of like, all in it together, let's make jam, like horse girl, second world war, (laughs) British kind of like TV show (laughs) message. But like, I do really like it that for the two main events, the Elwood bombardment and the existence of that POW camp, that like, I can really see it Mm -hmm. in my mind's eye because I'm familiar with those places. And 
like just getting some details about it was it made it seem more immediate than like history book history. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which actually never talks about Santa Barbara in the war, <laughs> except maybe for the Elwood thing. <laughs> so that is my story. And thank you for listening to me. Thanks, Summers. Yeah. Oh, that's wild. And now comes the point in the recording session where I go, oh, shoot. Where's I didn't think about an eight ball question. <laughs> I never think of an eight ball question. <laughs> Toss an oh, eight ball across the room. I have a suggestion, Ooh, which yes. you can take or leave. Did any of the POWs actually come back and settle here after the war? Good because one. they liked it so much. <laughs> and write the article <laughs> that we read. Okay. Okay. So let's find out, Magic Eight Ball. Do we have residents of Santa Barbara descendant from any of the POW camp people? POWs? <laughs> yes. I'm going to. We'll just use that when Summers asked it. You can edit me out. Okay, let's ask. It says something that I can't read. Oh, it's upside down. Again, our eight ball is viscous. Well, it's also like you have to look straight down. Yeah. yeah. And since I uh, prefer to lounging. record lounging, it's hard for me to read it. But it does, in fact, say my reply is no. Oh, oh see. Interesting. Hmm. Thanks for listening. <laughs> We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye, Mom. (laughs) Thanks for listening to The Ghoul's Guide to Santa Barbara. Like and subscribe on Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Ghoul's Guide to SB. Our website is ghoulsguidetosb.com. Got a spooky story or know of a haunted or paranormal location in Santa Barbara? Send it to us at ghoulsguidetosb at gmail.com. <laughs>